Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Derek Treesize. Um, so that was a great biography of uh, some of my background. I'm going to cover a little bit more in a moment here. But today I'd like to talk to you about the science of resistance training and plant-based nutrition for longevity. So I'm going to go ahead and share screen and bring up the show I have for you here. Perfect. So this is a topic that really excites me. It's been very much in the research lately. Um, resistance training, by and large in the past, has not gotten nearly as much uh, scientific and medical attention as cardiovascular exercise. So for a gym rat slash muscle head like myself, I'm very excited to see there's new publications coming out all the time that are showing profound health and physiological benefits of resistance training. Also, as many of the speakers in this conference are pointing out, plant-based nutrition has a very holistic and profound uh, impact on every parameter of our health. So it's exciting to look at how these two fields are gaining more information over time and how you can use both of them to maximize your health, your lifespan, and your health span, um, which we're going to talk about today. So a little bit about myself. We just saw a great introduction video, so I'm not going to spend too much time here. But my name is Derek Treesize, in case you guys missed that. Um, I have a bachelor's degree in biology, and I'm a certified personal trainer through the American Council on Exercise. I'm also a two-time professional natural bodybuilder through the World Natural Bodybuilding Federation and the Naturally Fit Federation. Uh, so I've had no problem as a vegan competing against uh, athletes on an omnivorous diet and winning. Um, so that's been very eye-opening, and I've, I use it as a very... Uh, I feel potent form of advocacy without having to say a word. If you just know you're vegan, um, people see that you can have, you can push your physique to the limit. You can build muscle and strength. You can lose body fat. Um, and that's, that's something that's been really important to me over the years. Uh, my wife and I authored the book, vegan muscle and fitness guide to bodybuilding competitions, where we broke down. It's very much a blueprint on how to control your physique, how to gain muscle, how to lose body fat, how to manipulate nutritional and exercise variables. So it's a guide that gets you to the bodybuilding stage, but it's a guide that anyone could benefit from if you want to take a precise approach to your fitness and nutrition. Um, so my wife and I also both own Root Force Personal Training, which is Richmond, Virginia, where we live's only plant-based gym. I work with clients here one-on-one -on -one and in small groups to help them achieve their best health and fitness. And we have the blog and fitness website, veganmuscleandfitness.com. So... A little overview about what I want to discuss today. Uh, we're going to start discussing aging and nutrition, or sorry, aging and longevity. Uh, what does it mean? What happens to our bodies as we, as time passes? Uh, we're going to discuss re or resistance training, what it means, what impacts it has on our body, because our body has a myriad of adaptations when we perform regular resistance training or regular strength training, and the role that plant-based nutrition has in complementing or um, bolstering those effects on our physiology. Implementation, we're going to talk about resistance training specifically. Uh, where do we start? What does the research say? What is the best place for someone to begin if their goal is a long, healthy life, not necessarily being a bodybuilder, not necessarily getting really big, really strong, but the lifespan and also health span. And then we're going to talk about resources, references, the research I talk about today, uh, and where you can go to find more information. And then we're going to have a Q&A period at the end. Now, looking at this picture here I shared, this was taken in 2017. My wife and I are the front and center there. Um, but this was Team Plant Built, which is a vegan strength and muscle sports team that competes together. And that year we did very good. This was in Austin, Texas at the Naturally Fit Show, uh, where I placed second in that show. It was very fun. But just showing off some of our uh, apparel from our website in this group photo, and I thought this was a fun photo to include here to show that we're not unique. I'm not unique. Unique. A lot of people can build a strong, fit, muscular body eating only plants. And so therefore, it is not necessary to harm your health, the environment or animals by consuming animal products to do so. All right, moving on. Aging is affecting all of us from the point of conception before you're ever even born. Our body begins to age. Time passes. Our gene expression gets less precise um, and we start to accumulate uh, free radical damage on our DNA. We start to lose length of our tel telomeres. There's a whole host of hallmarks of aging. But what does that mean on a macro scale? How does our body change over time? What will we notice? So some of the things we'll notice over time is we have an increased risk of virtually every disease and 
condition, except for those very few examples that occur in children specifically, uh, everything, the risk increases as time passes. Case in point, if you look at just about the most dangerous lifestyle habit you can have, which is smoking cigarettes, you could take someone who is a regular smoker at age 20, compare that to someone who does not smoke at all at age 70, and the 70-year-old's risk of lung cancer is actually higher than the 20 year old. So that 50 years of age is actually a greater risk factor for lung cancer than the 20 years of age, but having a smoking habit. The aging is a very serious risk factor for virtually every health condition. We can also expect to lose three to 5% of our flexibility per decade after the age of 30. So our muscles get tighter, we get stiffer, it gets harder to reach around and buckle your seatbelt, things like that. It gets harder to touch your toes. And this may be something that you might already be noticing. Uh, bone density. Our bones peak in strength and density in our mid-20s, like many physical attributes. And unless we do something to, st something to stimulate them, they're going to begin losing bone density thereafter. And that's going to continue to decline, and often at an accelerating rate, as we go into old age in our 60s, 70s, and beyond. Our metabolic rate, which this can be a little bit confusing for some people because it's often assumed that your metabolism, how many calories you burn, how much energy you have, et cetera, is, is kind of a fixed number that's going to change as you age. It's more based on your lean muscle mass and your daily activity level. But since those decline as we age, um, particularly if we don't do something to counteract these things, we can expect a 10% decrease in metabolic rate per decade after the age of 20. So it happens younger than some of these other things. Now, these last three I want to highlight, um, these last three points about aging happen per year, not per decade. So this is much more rapid changes. We can lose up to 2% of our muscle mass per year after the age of 40. And that, that adds up very quickly. Uh, we can lose up to 5%, that's a big number, of our strength and our power per year after the age of 40. Power just means our ability to accelerate and decelerate. Can you speed things up? Can you throw things? Can you jump? Or can you land and absorb forces and decelerate? Those are both very, very important attributes for athletes, obviously, but also for catching yourself when you're about to fall um, or for doing some more athletic daily tasks or yard work tasks, things like that. Um, so strength and power are things that we start to lose very rapidly uh, after the age of 40, unless we specifically work to counteract that. Now, as of 2021, in the U.S., the expected life span of a female is 79.3 years, and for a male, it's 73.5 years. So if we don't do things to counteract this, this is, this is what we can help, or this is what we can expect given the standard American diet and lifestyle. This is how long we can expect to live, and these are the changes we can expect our body to go through. But it doesn't have to be this way. So... This is a popular uh, image I've seen on the internet numerous times, but it is from a study. And these are MRI photos. If you don't know what you're looking at, if you picture wrapping your finger around your thighs, wrapping your two hands around your thigh and taking that cross-sectional slice in a picture so you can see what it looks like going through your thigh, that's what these images are, what's going on inside th the thigh. So we can see at the 40-year-old triathlete, that white circle in the middle, that very bright white circle is a nice, thick, dense, healthy bone. The gray material around it is thigh muscles, quadriceps, hamstring muscles. And then there's a very thin layer on the outside that is skin and subcutaneous body fat, which you need a little bit to be healthy. So you can see that's what a healthy athletic adult thigh looks like. Now, if you look at the bottom left, we have a 70 year old sedentary man's thigh with the cross section. And right away, I point you to the bone in the center. The bone is noticeably smaller. It has shrunken both in circumference and it's a fuzzy gray, which means it's less dense. It's not that nice, dense, bright white color. Around it, we have a lot less muscle. The muscle's darker and it has those white bands, which are marbling of body fat penetrating into the muscle fibers. Uh, and once body fat starts to do that, it's actually much harder to get rid of it once it's penetrating the muscle fibers. And then we have this wide band of white tissue around the muscles which is a lot of subcutaneous body fat. So this individual, after 30, 40, 50 years of being sedentary, not being physically active, they've lost a lot of bone density, a lot of muscle mass, and they've gained a lot of adipose tissue, a lot of body fat that they then have to carry around on this re weaker frame with weaker muscles. That's a recipe for falls, injuries, and poor health. 
But as I said, it doesn't have to be this way. The bottom right thighs, you can see, are very, very similar to the 40-year-old triathlete. And they're a 70-year-old triathlete. Still have nice, dense bones, still have thick muscle mass with no infiltrated body fat. And I would say even less subcutaneous body fat around the outside. So with a lot of hard training and exercise consistently over years and years, you don't have to experience those declines that we mentioned in the previous slide. Upwards of 90% of them can be prevented. I have a couple cases in point for this argument that are more than just that slide. Jack and Joe, Jacqueline and Joe Rolino are some excellent examples of what fitness, strength training, and nutrition can do for you. So remember on that uh, previous slide, I mentioned the average life expectancy for a male in the US right now is about 73 and a half years. If you average these two gentlemen's lifespan, they lived 100 years. So a full 25% more than that. Jacqueline, if you guys haven't heard of him, he's a very famous fitness advocate with TV show, books, guest appearances, um, crazy exercise stunts uh, for years and years. Jacqueline was a, a fixture in the fitness industry when Arnold Schwarzenegger was touching weights for the first time. So he started well before and was promoting these things for a long, long time. Uh, his focus was whole foods, so especially plant foods, but he was pescatarian. So he ate some dairy, some fish, uh, but lots of fruits and vegetables. His kind of catch line slogan was, if man makes it, don't eat it. So he was one of the very first people to espouse kind of the dangers of processed food. He specifically focused on avoiding meat and avoiding sugar if you want to live a long and healthy life. Uh, he, he did crazy workout stunts. He would um, do these long swimming challenges for every decade birthday um, where he lived in San Francisco. He would swim across the San Francisco Bay, shackled and handcuffed like an escaped inmate. Um, and as he got older, he would start pulling boats while he was swimming across the bay with people in them. And this was to show you that he was still strong, healthy, and fit for these extreme athletic events into his 70s, 80s, and beyond. He had a daily regimen of strength training for one hour and swimming for one hour um, for over 70 years. He did this from his 20s until his 90s. Um, and he was unfortunately killed by pneumonia a few years ago at the age of 96. Uh, a cool story about Jack is he started weightlifting in high school when he began high school. It was very unpopular. There's a couple of senior kids uh, who had a weight set and they wouldn't let him use it. He asked to use it and they said he was too puny. So he challenged him to a wrestling match. He's like, if I can beat both of you at a wrestling match, then I get to use your weights. They agreed. He whipped him and he got to use the weights. So he started weightlifting when he was in his early teens and he never stopped. Joel, Re Joel Rolino was from New York. Um, I believe he lived in Brooklyn, but he was a lifelong strict vegetarian. He was often wrote about not eating any animal, uh, not eating any meat products. Uh, he was a strong man way back in the 1920s. Uh, he had crazy feats of strength. He would walk around with a bar across his shoulder with four or five men hanging from the bar. He could bend a quarter in half with his fingers. Uh, he was always also a champion boxer. He was a bodyguard for a period of time. He fought in World War II and was awarded three different Purple Hearts. If you guys have seen the movie Forrest Gump, uh, the scene where Forrest Gump in Vietnam is pulling wounded soldiers out of the battleground by carrying them on his shoulder, Joe Rolina did that in real life, but he would get two or three men at a time. Uh, and he went back several times to some of these battlegrounds, pulling out several wounded men at once because he was so powerful, so strong. Even though he was not a big guy, he was 5'5 five, five or 5'6. Five, but that was how he was awarded some of these awards. And at the age of 100, 104, he was unfortunately struck by a van crossing the street. So he was still fit and active at that point. Uh, a couple of parallels I want to draw between these two guys. They both started strength training at a young age and kept training for their whole life. They both worked hard and were strong. They also both liked swimming, especially in the ocean, although we're not going to talk about any kind of benefits or risks inherent in swimming today. Uh, and they were both fit and active until the day they died. I want to really make this point important because um, it's hard to tease out things that increase maximum lifespan, especially with anecdotal evidence such as these two gentlemen. But you can easily look at their health span. Jack Lane was killed by an infection at the age of 96. Joe Rolino was killed in an automobile accident at the age of 104. They were killed from external um, problems, essentially, rather than the deterioration of their body over time. They did not have chronic disease. They were not suffering from diabetes. 
They didn't have any of these neurological or um, other chronic conditions that a lot of people suffer from. They were fit and healthy. Jacqueline, for example, doing a hard strength training and a hard swimming workout every single morning into his 90s. And he was able to do that. He kept that level of physical fitness and that health until just before he died. Joel Rolino, just before he died in his 100s, could still bend a dime in half with his fingers. He couldn't do a quarter anymore. He laughed about it. But he could still bend a dime in half. So by maintaining this level of activity, this level of strength, they were able to enjoy being that active just about until the day they died. So their health span and their lifespan both increased. They weren't old and sick. They were old and vital and fit and able to do what they wanted. So benefits of strength training. I'll say the first benefit of strength training, if you look at this image here, is you can pick up your kids from school. Some people use a car, I use a bamboo pole. I'm just kidding, but if you wanna pick up your kids, you don't have to use iron for weights. There's all sorts of ways to use weights. Um, but there are other benefits of strength training too. Uh, it mitigates each of the age-related degenerations we mentioned on that first slide about aging. Um, particularly those last three that I, I mentioned were measured in per year losses rather than per decade losses, which is muscle mass, strength, and power. Those are the things we start losing the most quickly after the age of 40, unless we work hard against them. And as I'm going to describe soon, those are the things that are most closely tied with a long, healthy life like Joe and Jack had. So strength training can directly affect, directly halt those upwards of 90%. You can, you can delay or offset some of these things by over 90%. It maintains physical function and resilience. So just like Jack and Joe, I mentioned, they were able to do what they wanted. They were able to do hard workouts. They were able to bend dimes in half, if that is your thing, um, up until just before they died. And they lived an average of 100 years. So rather than having 50, 60 years and then having this deterioration where you're not healthy, you can't do things, you're dealing with these chronic conditions and side effects from medications, they felt great. And then something killed them at the end of their life. Uh, strength training helps you get that kind of health span. It improves brain function, brain aging, and mental health. And this is something that's just becoming more apparent as we start to study it more. So it's a very exciting field to be looking into. Uh, strength training, aside from other exercise, aside from other healthy habits like plant-based nutrition, has its own unique benefits um, to mental health and preventing and offsetting things like dementia or other cognitive decline, Alzheimer's disease. So that's pretty exciting. Um, as I mentioned earlier, it maintains your metabolic rate because metabolism is more a function of your lean body mass, how much muscle mass you carry, and your activity level, how much you move around, how many steps you take. And that does tend to decline with age, but it doesn't have to. If you strength train to maintain your muscle mass and you make sure to move around a lot, you stay busy, you garden, you do chores, you go on walks with friends, and yeah, you go to the gym, um, your metabolism doesn't have to slow down hardly at all. It dramatically increases your resistance to injuries and your recovery rate from them. So if you remember the first slide with the cross sections of the thighs, we saw the nice dense bones that those thighs of the athletes had, whether they were 40 or 70, um, compared to that weaker, smaller kind of gray looking bone that the sedentary individual had, whose bone do you think is more easily broken? If they fall, which it's more likely to fall if you don't have strong muscles, um, you're more likely to bounce right back up and not get injured. Or if you do get injured, strong muscles with lots of circulation, dense, healthy bones are going to have a much quicker and easier time recovering from an injury. So that becomes more and more and more important the older we get. You want to avoid injuries. And when you do have an injury, you need to bounce back and get moving again. The other thing that's often not appreciated is recovery from illness. Strength training has ability to build muscle mass, to build resilience in all the other ways we're mentioning but it bolsters your immune system. Um, there's not too much understood about this, but one of the methods is um, through the mediation of your hormones. Strength, uh, muscle mass can actually release chemicals called myokines that have a myriad of effects across your body. And it is shown that people who strength train have more muscle mass, get sick less often, recover faster. And whether it's acute disease or an illness, when you check into the hospital, particularly over the age of 65, you can gauge what your recovery rate will be or your recovery chances will be based on how much lean muscle mass you have. Uh, it can be a very much an asset uh, in terms of your chance of bouncing back from something serious in illness as well as injury. 
So as I mentioned, this is an exciting field right now, especially in the last 10 to 15 years, there has been a lot of studies coming out about strength training and not, not its effect on performance because that's been studied for a long time, but its effect on health and its effect on lifespan and chronic disease. Um, so I love seeing this and I love learning about this and sharing this information with you guys. The first study I wanted to mention, there's, there's many studies, but I chose kind of my top favorites here, is grip strength was found, and this is a large meta-analysis with many, many participants over a long period of time, was a better predictor of mortality risk, which is your chance of dying from any number of things, um, than blood pressure. Blood pressure is often used as the gold standard. As your blood pressure goes up, your risk of dying from diabetes, heart disease, you name it, goes up as well. Well, it turns out grip strength, as grip strength goes up, your risk of dying goes down. And if you look at the graph I listed here from this study, um, the hazard ratio, ratio, which is another way of saying um, risk of mortality, goes down as grip strength goes up. And it's not a curve. It doesn't bottom out somewhere. It keeps improving. So those with stronger and stronger grip saw more and more protection from all the things that would normally kill them. Uh, and I thought that was very interesting because almost everything in health has a curve. There's some point where it bottoms out and balances off. Um, but in this study, which had a lot of data, uh, the stronger, the better for that grip strength. Another one, firefighters. This was a Harvard study that came out a few years ago for push-ups. Um, firefighters able to do more than 40 push-ups in a row, just drop and give me 40, uh, had a 96% less lower chance of having a cardiac event than those who could do 10 or less push-ups. So it's another situation where you're looking at core strength, you're looking at upper body strength, and you're also looking at cardiovascular fitness because push-ups do get you winded. Um, someone who has a healthy body that's able to just drop and do 40 push-ups is much healthier overall and much less likely to suffer from an event tied to our number one cause of death in this country, which is cardiovascular disease. Uh, this next one, I was very shocked at these numbers. Um, women over 65, I was looking at women and men, but women in particular who were met this criteria they had for low muscle mass, which looking at body mass index and various things, it was the very lowest sliver of people who had the least muscle mass. Um, so a small subset of the group, but those with the lowest muscle mass had a 63 time higher alcohol mortality rate. And that's, that's phenomenally higher, so especially women as they got older, the ones who were the most frail had that low muscle mass categorization were much, much more likely to die from anything. And it was also seen to be very striking in men, but not as much so as 11 times more likely in men. So that is profound that especially as we get older, muscle mass protects us from virtually everything that might kill us. Total mortality risk in this next study is significantly lower for those with basically the most muscle mass compared to the least. Um, that's what those quartiles are when you break it into groups of four. The, the fourth with the most muscle mass had significantly lower all-cause mortality risk, which lines up with this other information we're seeing. So a lot of, in, the, uh, in most of these studies, as I mentioned, came out in the last 10 years. So this is this is exciting information. Um, other things we see here, and here I'm kind of comparing resistance training to some other things we do like cardiovascular training or like weight loss. Um, resistance training, as I mentioned, prevents Alzheimer's and cognitive decline in general. So it has a lot of brain health protecting benefits that are independent of other healthy lifestyle factors, such as nutrition, such as cardiovascular. Combining resistance training and cardiovascular training, which everyone should do, let it be stated on the record, I don't want anyone to avoid cardio just so they can strength train. You should do both. They both are very beneficial in different ways. But combining those two reduce, reduce total mortality risk of all participants across ages by 41%. That's the same as someone with a light smoking habit compared to a non-smoker. Um, so that's a profound difference. You can have essentially the same reduction in risk as someone who is giving up smoking quarter, half a pack of cigarettes a day by doing your resistance training, cardiovascular training. If you look at this chart I included on the right, there's four yellow points. Um, the two on the left are without resistance training. The two on the right are with resistance training and it's yes or no for cardio. So the very leftmost is no resistance training, no cardio. They have the highest risk of death. Just cardio with no resistance training dropped it a bit. But if you notice the next point, with just resistance training and no cardiovascular exercise, the risk of death was a little bit lower. So if you wanna look at a head to head, and this was a meta-analysis with a lot of data, the, the resistance training was actually slightly more protective than the cardio. Again, I'm not saying you should not do cardio because by far the best benefit was those who did both. They had that 41% reduction in mortality risk. Um, but it shows you how profound an effect 
resistance training has. And the fact that the two complement each other and you have an even lower risk when you do both of them tells you that they're doing different things to help protect you, which is why it's important to do both. Um, now we're looking at uh, the next two points here. Muscular strength was inversely associated with the mortality risk, independent of cardiovascular fitness. That kind of backs up what we see in this graph I included here. So that means whether or not you do cardio, muscular strength is protecting your health still do your cardio. It's just saying it's doing something different. And then grip strength, as I mentioned before, which is just a way of measuring strength and activity, um, predicted decreased mortality risk independent of body mass index, which means even if you're overweight, being stronger protects you. So again, I want you to be a healthy body weight. You should definitely focus on having a healthy body mass, body mass index and body fat level. But strength protects you regardless of your cardiovascular fitness, regardless of if you're overweight or not it's still protective. So it's doing something different than these other things and it's having a powerful effect. I'm gonna change gears a little bit and talk about plant-based nutrition. Plant-based nutrition, I'm gonna let the lectures, the other lectures in this conference cover a lot of that because they're doing a great job and a lot of them have a lot more qualification than I do in talking about it. But I wanna highlight some things that tie into strength training a little bit and resistance training. So it benefits resistance training. Plant-based nutrition absolutely does, as I will testify by being a successful natural bodybuilder. Uh, plant proteins have been shown to build just as much muscle mass as animal protein. And that's this chart I included here from that study. Um, whether you're omnivorous or vegetarian vegan, uh, they were vegan in this study. Muscle cross fibril area over a period of time working out and eating a fairly high protein diet, I think it was 20 or 22% of their calories in this study saw the same increase in muscle mass. So if you're eating enough protein um, or even more that some would argue than you need here, uh, it doesn't matter if you're vegan or omnivore in terms of how much muscle mass you can gain. So in other words, there's no need to focus on animal proteins if your goal is to gain muscle mass and strength. It's not necessary. Plant protein is just as good. Um, other benefits for resistance training is circulation. Uh, you may have heard from Dr. Esselstyn's studies um, he's a presenter in this conference is, um, when you eat a plant-based diet, your blood actually becomes less viscous, which means it flows more easily. It's thinner. Um, you don't have the buildup of plaques, your endothelial cells, which line the insides of your blood vessels and release nitric oxide so that your blood vessels can dilate. They're healthier with a plant-based diet. So you're able to dilate your blood vessels more effectively. And with a thinner blood, your blood flows much more easily. What that means is you're delivering nutrients to your muscles more easily, faster, and you're removing waste products from your muscles more easily and faster. That's going to spell better recovery. That's going to spell more success for your resistance training than if you have a damaged circulatory system from your diet. Fall, uh, phytochemicals like polyphenols, if you follow longevity research at all right now, it's, it's kind of a hot topic. Polyphenols are very big, um, whether in the group that's keto and is telling you to guzzle olive oil because of its polyphenols, or whether you're vegan and eating blueberries because of their polyphenols, or red wine for the resveratrol, which is a polyphenol. Um, it's pretty widely accepted right now and touted that polyphenols are good for you, and they are stimulating your body's natural defenses against aging, which is slowing down damage and increasing repair rates of DNA, gene expression, many things like that. Polyphenols come from plants. They don't come from animal products. So when you're talking about polyphenols, you can substitute in whole plant foods and say the same thing. Whole plant foods are slowing down the aging process, slowing down oxidative damage with these antioxidants and helping you recover and protect yourself better. So that's going to also spell less damage to your muscles from a hard workout because you have all these protective molecules in your system and faster recovery. So plants have the appropriate amount and type of protein kind of ties into that study I shared there. If you're eating enough plants, you're getting enough protein and you're getting all the amino acids you need. You don't need to worry about mixing, combining, or supplementing any kind of special proteins here. And they have improved insulin sensitivity, which this is something um, better uh, covered by doctors like Dr. Barnard, Dr. Gregor. They talk much more in depth about this, but essentially by eating less saturated fat, by eating more complex carbohydrates, you're improving insulin's ability to stimulate your muscles, to pull carbohydrates, pull sugars out of your blood to restore their glycogen. So that's another way your muscles are going to fuel themselves before exercise and recover after exercise is by getting that signal from insulin that, hey, it's time for us to pull some sugar out of the blood because we can fill up our storage tanks. If that signal gets blunted, 
and you start becoming insulin resistant, that has a whole host of negative health effects. Um, it increases your risk of cardiovascular disease. Obviously, it's directly related to diabetes, directly related to obesity. So a plant-based diet improving insulin sensitivity is absolutely essential for bolstering your uh, response to resistance training and just keeping you healthier overall. Now, but that's not all plants can do. Plant-based nutrition also benefits longevity. And this, again, I'm kind of keeping it specific to resistance training. I'll let people talk more about chronic disease in other lectures. Um, our number one killer in the U.S. is cardiovascular disease. So if you can do anything to prevent or slow cardiovascular disease, you're going to increase your chances of living a long, full life. It just so happens a whole food plant-based diet, like the one Dr. Esselstyn advocates, like the one Dr. Kahn advocates, is going to, is the only proven thing to reverse heart disease and to shrink plaques and open up arteries. And if that's our number one killer, that of course is going to help us live a longer, healthier life. So the other thing I'm going to take a nod to Dr. T. Colin Campbell here from the China study, he and his studies cited um, how higher protein diets stimulated cancer growth in rats when they were studying carcinogens like aflatoxin and liver tumors. But the protein they were using in those studies was casein from milk, which is an animal protein. When they repeated the studies again, using higher low protein levels of plant proteins, they did not see the tumor genesis. Now, again, this is in rats, so we haven't done the study in humans because you can't feed humans carcinogens. But this right here shows that potentially even a higher protein diet with plant proteins is not going to stimulate cancer, which is a another deadly killer in our country, the way a high protein animal based diet would. So we mentioned on the previous slide that at a higher protein intake, plants build just as much muscle as animal proteins do. And here we can see that they're still having a profoundly different impact on our, on the rest of our body. So you can have the muscle mass gain. You don't have to have the increased risk of cancer and heart disease. So phytochemicals like polyphenols, I mentioned in the previous slide, are going to bolster our natural um, resistance to aging or repair mechanisms. Um, and they specifically stimulate the genes, the sirtuin genes, which are focusing on gene expression and regulating gene expression so that we don't have the wrong genes coming on and the wrong genes turning off. They work directly on that pathway that is really, really important for making sure that we're using the best possible genes for our body so that it's protecting itself and staying young and vital and healthy. Um, the protein from plants as compared to protein from animals is much lower in methionine and branch chain amino acids like leucine, isoleucine, and valine. You don't need to remember those, not important. But what you do need to remember is that these things are directly related to our body's production of insulin-like growth factor, which is a hormone we release that stimulates growth. It tells us that things are good and it's time to grow, 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 reproduce, whatever. Insulin-like growth factor is also very strongly implicated in cancer risk and in the overall aging rate. In fact, if you look at populations in South America, this is um, information from research Dr. Dr. Valter Longo out of USC has done. There is a, a small population of individuals who have a natural mutation where their body does not produce insulin-like growth factor one. They're normally a lot sh shorter than typical individuals. They're about five feet or slightly under. But regardless of how much they drink, regardless of how much they smoke, they don't get heart disease, they don't get cancer, and they live their 80s, 90s, and 100s um, because they don't produce this insulin-like growth factor one. So for a long, healthy life, for minimal levels of chronic disease and maximal levels of health span and lifespan, you want to keep IGF-1 low. And plant proteins are much better at doing that. Animal proteins are not. Um, mentioned the insulin sensitivity on the previous slide. Uh, again, there are people in this conference who are more qualified to talk in depth about that than I am, but something that insulin sensitivity um, is directly related to is AMPK, which is adenosine monophysate kinase. Uh, it's basically an energy sensing molecule. When you hear that fasting is beneficial for you, um, AMPK is stimulated by fasting because AMPK senses low energy levels. Same thing with exercise. When you exercise a lot and you burn your energy stores, AMPK is stimulated because it is stimulated by low energy levels and sensing low energy levels, it turns on protective mechanisms to bolster your body against the wear and tear of aging. Um, having better insulin sensitivity from eating a plant-based diet is going to keep AMPK more active more of the time because insulin is sensitive and you're keeping energy levels lower. 
Um, so again, other researchers can talk more in depth about that, but this is another way that a plant-based diet is going to be beneficial for a long health and lifespan compared to a more omnivorous or standard American diet. All right, now we're gonna go into practical stuff. See this handsome devil in the picture here is myself rowing a big dumbbell just to show you um, that plants don't make you weak. And I included in this slide because that bottom bullet point there, intensity does matter. Research does show that. Um, and I could have included more citations there. But to start off, strength training recommendations for um, lifespan, for mortality risk, I should say, not lifespan, for lowering your risk of dying from all causes has a U-shaped curve. Um, so I mentioned with when I mentioned grip strength, it was impressive that it had a line rather than a curve. Strength training in general has a U-shaped curve, which is what you normally see in biological systems, which means that as you do more, your risk goes down. I'm making a gesture with my hands. I'm not sure if you can see it, but you picture your risk going down as you do more. There's a bottoming out point at the bottom of the U where your risk is the least. And as you keep doing more, if you do strength training more and more and more often, your risk actually starts to go back up a little bit. So there's a sweet spot, a Goldilocks spot for resistance training. And there are a lot of factors here. This was... Um, these recommendations come from a big meta analysis. So this is a lot of people doing a lot of things um, and they, they weren't able to go into specifics too much with that large of a population. But by and large, people who did two to three strength training sessions a week for an hour or less saw the best results in terms of their mortality risk. Um, and someone who's training more than that, five, six, seven times a week, your risk of dying is not as high as someone who doesn't train. So it's not like it goes all the way back up. It's just not quite as good as those people who are a little more moderate. Um, so doing it a little left often, like say, for example, every other day would be optimal if your goal is absolute longevity. Um, training all muscle groups of your body for five to eight exercises. This is more of an exercise science recommendation. There's not a lot of specifics, as I mentioned, with the, um, the longevity research yet. There's more work to be done, which is exciting. Um, but Use five to eight exercises, train all the muscle groups of the body, do some upper body pushing, upper body pulling. Um, I very much a fan of compound exercises, which are free weights or body weight exercises um, that use more than one joint because you have to stabilize, you have to balance, you have to teach your body to move in space. Um, machines are great though, if you're an at-risk population at all. So I'm not saying machines are off the table. I'm just saying that if you can, a compound exercise that uses multiple joints like a squat or a lunge, um, and free weight or body weight is going to be the best bang for your buck. If you're doing these two to three sessions, two to three sets per exercise, um, is perfectly adequate. If you're training, for example, two sets of 15 repetitions per exercise or three sets of 10 repetitions, um, the repetitions aren't that important, um, which I'll go into in a moment, but this is going to, these recommendations are going to give you a, a starting point on how to structure your workout. How much should you be doing? Uh, and then from there, I would say the, the final bullet point is really important. Intensity matters. So while we saw that U-shaped curve for how many training sessions per week, where your risk starts to go back up if you're doing more and more and more, we didn't see that as much for intensity, um, granted that you stayed at that lower level. So for example, it's better to do two strength training sessions a week and work hard, work very hard, gain strength, get tired than it is to do six kind of mellow, easy strength training sessions a week. And again, there's not a lot of really precise recommendations yet, um, but they did see um, in numerous studies that people who were training harder, trying to get stronger, trying to improve their, their biomarkers and their physical performance saw the most benefit, the most protection against um, all those age-related declines we had earlier in the lecture. So that's why I included this slide here. Train hard, train heavy. And I will say that um, if I had to pick one parameter to focus on from all this research that we're looking through, it's strength. Now, you don't need to become a power lifter. Your grandmother doesn't need to become a power lifter. You don't have to start entering weightlifting competitions and doing one rep maxes. But it's important to try and get stronger. Um, and when I, I didn't list repetitions here intentionally. Um, because it's not as essential. The latest research actually shows that you can build just as much muscle and nearly as much strength doing much higher repetitions than previously thought. So say, for example, you don't like doing eight or 10 repetitions, you'd rather do 30. You can build just as much muscle and nearly as much strength doing that with a lighter weight, provided you work hard enough. 
And that's important. No matter what your sets, at least one set per exercise, at least once a week should be approaching failure. You should feel like you could not do another couple of reps on that last set. Um, and that's going to stimulate the most benefits and that's going to give you the most protection and maintain the most physical function. Now, safety considerations. Before you go and say, Derek told me to absolutely max out, max out, join a powerlifting competition and break my back, consult your doctor, please. Always consult your doctor before starting any new exercise program, especially if you have any pre-existing health conditions or you just don't know. If you've never set foot in a gym, you want to get a checkup first and make sure you're good to go. Test, don't guess. All right. Technique is extremely important. I'll say not only for preventing injuries, obviously having bad form makes you much more likely to get an injury and having good form makes you much less likely. But having good technique is also going to dramatically increase your results. You will gain more, more muscle. You will gain more strength. You will have denser, stronger, healthier bones and ligaments and tendons with proper technique. So as a trainer, I'm a little biased, but I'd say definitely consider hiring a personal trainer. It is worth the money. Even if you don't do it for more than a month or two, learn the skills you need to do things correctly, make sure they're vetted and have the credentials they need because it will pay dividends over your lifetime. Um, if you're on any medications, and this is important, review with your doctor if there's any exercise contraindications. If you have medications that lower your blood pressure and you're prone to dizziness, maybe doing really heavy weight squats right off the bat aren't a good idea. Um, other things like that. Um, and it's particularly if you have any sort of cardiac issues, Talk to your doctor about if you need to limit your heart rate or limit your blood pressure during exercise. Um, these are important considerations that people often don't think about, but the goal here is to live a long time and to be as healthy as possible. So doing something that might hurt or damage your body is counterproductive to that goal. Now, we're talking about a few more recommendations here for at-risk populations. So here we're on people who are, you know, more advanced in age and not currently physically active, or people who have you know, had cardiac events or bypass surgery, for example, or on a lot of medications, just a more at-risk individual. Definitely um, see the safety precautions I just mentioned, but we're also going to talk about when you're training, other ways to protect yourself and make sure you're starting off safe. So start with two non-consecutive non strength training days per week. Make sure they're a couple days apart, and that way you have a chance to recover. See if you're straining anything, see if you feel off. Um, before you go back into the gym, you don't want to do three or four days in a row and realize that first day was too much and you're already invested in all this and you've had accumulated problems. Warm up and cool down thoroughly. So increasing your core temperature, increasing your circulation with cardiovascular exercise is essential for anyone. I have all my clients do it when they walk through the door. We spend five or 10 minutes or if you're at risk, I would do more than 10 minutes. Um, just getting your heart rate up, getting your breathing rate up to make sure that your body is fully warmed and prepared for the work to come. Um, if you have any sort of risk issues, particularly cardiovascular disease risk issues, it just makes sense to get that cardiovascular system warmed up to get all the circulatory system as dilated as possible. Um, lighter weight and higher reps are also protective um, in general, but again, with someone who's at risk, heavier weights are going to cause more bracing and more muscle contraction and drive your blood pressure higher. Um, you know, for someone who's doing a max lift in a weightlifting competition, for the, for the very brief period of time they're lifting that weight, their blood pressure goes through the roof because their body is braced and squeezing so hard, it's squeezing your blood vessels too. If you're at risk with already high blood pressure or have had a cardiac event, that's not safe. At least not at first, you can certainly build up. So start with lighter weights, start with a lower RPE, which means rate of perceived exertion, which is like on a scale of one to 10, how hard was it? Start with six or less. Um, Keep it on the on a scale of one to 10, it was five. So that's where that intensity recommendation doesn't come in yet. Get out of the at-risk population category and then start pushing the envelope, not first. Um, you wanna avoid breathing, especially or avoid holding your breath. Don't avoid breathing, it's really good for you. Um, avoid holding your breath uh, to moderate your blood pressure. So similarly, if you brace and go hold your breath like people do before a big lift because it makes you more tighter and more stable, that's driving your blood pressure up a little higher because everything is squeezed and you don't have that relaxation that comes with an exhale. That's not something you want to do if you're at risk of, for example, a stroke or, for example, another cardio like a cardio event. So 
don't hold your breath. Make sure you take nice, even, steady breathing through the entire exercise. And that's going to help moderate your blood pressure even further. Um, continuous lifting tempo as, as well. So we don't, uh, normally I definitely recommend pausing. I like to make all my clients pause at the bottom of every repetition because it's much safer on your joints and much harder on your muscles. So it gets you in that nice locked in position. Someone's at very high risk. I don't recommend this. And it's also for that blood pressure reason. When you're pausing, your muscles brace harder, your blood pressure goes up a little more. So in a nice, smooth tempo. And when I list four two here for your continuous lifting tempo, I mean four seconds down, two seconds up. That's what I'm talking about. So four, three, two, one, up and two. Um, just nice and smooth, nothing accelerating, nothing jarring uh, is going to be the safest way to go if you're just getting started. And then lastly, limiting overhead exercises, overhead shoulder presses, overhead arm exercises, things like that are also going to be a little bit more gentle on your cardiovascular system. Those things tend to raise your blood pressure a little bit as well. So these are all just considerations for a small subset of the population that, that really wants to get into resistance training that would see a ton of benefit from it, but is concerned and, you know, is rightfully concerned. These are some ways to protect yourself and still get out there and get started. So references, talk about references. Don't worry about that so much. Um, you're welcome to review these later on your own. Um, before we launch into Q&A, I want to say you can find out more on our website, which is veganmuscleandfitness.com. We have our book that um, you guys are welcome to look into if you'd like a precise plan for gaining muscle, losing body fat, using bodybuilding's methods. There's also veganbodybuilding.com is a great resource, and there's tons of other books out there. The speakers in this group, who I, I very much um, encourage you to follow our doctor or re registered dietitian, Juliana Hever and Robert Cheek. They both have several books that are also covering topics like this that would be really beneficial. All right. Thank you so much, Derek, for that very informative presentation. So now we're going to begin our live Q&A session. I'll be asking some questions as well as opening up questions to the audience. Mm -hmm. And uh, before we do that, I'd like to let everybody know how, exactly how this works. We don't take questions directly from the chat. Instead, we ask everyone to virtually raise their hand. If you're not sure how to do this, what you need to do is click on the reactions button at the bottom right of the Zoom, second from the right. Then click on the raise hand function in the menu that pops up. When I call your name, I will unmute you and prompt you to state where you're from and to ask your question. We ask that everybody keep their questions brief and on topic. We will then mute you. All right. If you want to ask another question, then you can just hop on the back of the line, raise your hand. So let's get started. So uh, the first question is, can can whole food plant-based bodybuilders get as big as, uh, as people who uh, eat animal products? Great question. Uh, whole food plant-based. I would say yes. I've never seen a head-to-head -head study on this. I don't know that a study has been done. I would love to see one. Um, so I cannot give you a definitive yes, but based on the research I've seen and my own experience as a natural bodybuilder, I would say absolutely. Um, granted, everyone involved is natural. Um, if, if you start taking performance enhancing drugs, all bets are off. Obviously, whoever is doing that is going to have a tremendous advantage that's not going to be um, mediated by any sort of nutritional like excellent nutrition practices okay thank you um all right our first audience question is going to come from halal halal please stay where you're from and, and ask your question hi yes hello harris from south florida uh, my question is that uh, exercise science has often compared uh whey protein to other protein sources such as uh, rice protein and soy, and they've consistently shown that whey stimulates uh, muscle protein synthesis faster and what they consider to be more efficiently than does uh, vegetarian uh, sources of protein. Uh, my question is, now I know that you can build muscle through vegan sources because I do as a vegan athlete, uh, but I'm just curious to see what your perspective is when you compare whey to other sources of protein. And then just a follow up, they're now coming out with uh, vegan sources of whey, that they're producing whey protein in the lab, uh, not from a uh, animal source. 
And I'm wondering if you've had familiarity with these products. Sure. Uh, thank you, Mr. Harris. Um, so first question is addressing the direct comparison between whey protein and some other plant protein isolates like rice, like soy. Um, yes, I have absolutely seen those studies that whey protein can stimulate more muscle protein synthesis um, than do these other molecules or do these other. Um, one thing I want to point out is these are comparing supplements. So these are isolated nutrients we're looking at. And we're also looking at muscle protein synthesis in those studies, which is, you know, you're looking at the genes that are turning on building protein versus the genes that don't or the genes that turn it off. That doesn't necessarily translate into how much muscle you were built. There's more going on than just acute muscle protein synthesis. And I like to look at the macro studies where we're looking at the entire individual with all their training and all their diet rather than isolated nutrients and isolated incident changes in genetic expression. Um, and when you look at that in the study I, I showed above, people on a plant-based diet can build just as much muscle as long as they're consuming adequate protein. So, and regarding the, the artificial or the plant-based way, I have heard a little bit. I don't know much about it, honestly. I would be concerned uh, that it would have some of the drawbacks of other animal proteins, even if it's artificially produced. Is it stimulating insulin like growth factor? Is it overstimulating mTOR and increasing our disease risk, increasing our aging rate? So I still plan on sticking to plant proteins, even when more, you know, ethically sourced animal protein analogs become available. Thank you very much. Uh, our next question is coming from John P. Please state where you're from and ask your question. Hi, I'm John from New York. Hi, Derek. Great for great presentation. Um, what do you eat for breakfast, lunch, and dinner on a given day? Hey, John. Happy to tell you. Um, this is one of the topics I read a lot about because people want to know, which is good. Uh, I focus primarily on whole foods. I'm not perfect, and I do want to enjoy myself, and I do have kids, so sometimes you just need some dark chocolate. <laughs> um, but by and large, I have a great big serving of oatmeal in the, in the morning. Like this morning, I had two and a half cups of oats. I have a lot of fruit in there for my polyphenols. Um, so lots of berries, some walnuts, apple, some figs, um, and then every spice in the rack. Because again, I want to maximize those phytonutrients and spices have a ton. So I'm having cinnamon, I'm having cardamom, I'm having ginger, I'm having cloves. Um, that's my breakfast. Lunch varies, but it's usually some kind of blackened tofu dish. I either have blackened tofu over cauliflower rice with maybe some hot sauce, or I'll have like a big salad, a vinaigrette salad with lots and lots and lots of veggies, huge salad with blackened tofu on top. Um, in the afternoon, I have a bean shake, which you can read about on our website or on veganbodybuilding.com. I put some recipes on there, which is basically a great big smoothie. Um, it has nuts, seeds, it has bananas, it has white beans is kind of the secret ingredient. Um, and then spinach or kale or some kind of thing. And then dinner is a wild card. We'll have rice and beans. We'll have sweet potatoes and veggie chicken tenders. We'll go out to eat and get Thai food. Um, but my diet is very consistently fitting that mold year round and it has for a decade. And uh, Derek, what, what are your thoughts on intermittent fasting with regard to, uh, to building muscle? Sure. Absolutely happy to answer this one, Michael. This is another hot topic. And because in part um, of its relationship to aging, inter intermittent fasting has been shown to increase lifespan in many model organisms, um, fruit flies up to, to mammals. Um, my thoughts on intermittent fasting are that, and, and the research I've read, because I've, I've read a bit, is that it absolutely can still yield muscle gains. You can still gain just about as much muscle, perhaps a little bit less on an intermittent fasting diet. Um, but you tend to be leaner. So that would be a benefit. You build just as much muscle or almost as much, but less body fat. Uh, I will say that on a diet, on a calorie reduced diet, people who intermittent fast tend to lose more muscle than those who are not intermittent fasting. So if you're trying to lose weight, um, it might actually be beneficial not to intermittent fast, even though intermittent fasting can help weight loss, you might lose a larger proportion of muscle mass. And kind of the cautionary point I want to make with intermittent fashion, there's two things, intermittent fasting, forgive me. Um, there's two things to consider. One is the time of day is incredibly important. Um, we are most metabolically sensitive and efficient, most insulin sensitive, everything beginning of the day, we're a diurnal organism. So our digestive cues and our hormonal cues are all based on the day of the sunshine. You want to get in your eight hour window in the first part of the day. If you do it in the second part of the day, like say, for example, noon to 8 PM, you're still, um, it's still shown that you see a lot of those, um, 
body composition benefits. You get leaner without losing the muscle mass, for example. But a lot of the other health markers like blood pressure, like blood cholesterol, actually are not benefited. And that's because eating later in the day is not as good for you. We're less insulin sensitive, which means we're eating more like someone who has insulin resistance. Um, so I would say intermittent fasting can be an excellent tool, but you need to make sure you're eating in the first half of the day. Um, other thing to consider, Dr. Walter Longer's research shows that people who intermittent fast um, or who fast for more than you know, 12, 14 hours a day have twice the risk of gallstones. And it could be because you have an increased um, production of bile in the gallbladder to break down ketones as your body goes into ketosis from the long fast. We don't really know. But it's something to consider if you already have a, a, an increased risk for gallstones or gallbladder problems, it might not be for you. And do you know if that was with plant-based eaters versus animal eaters with the to gallstones? I would assume it was not with plant-based eaters. Thank you. And you mentioned your diet. Do you know the diet of other like elite plant-based bodybuilders? Uh, do they eat very similar to you? And uh, what about the, the idea that we need to have a tremendous amount of protein when we're bodybuilding? Sure. Happy to answer this. Um, vegan bodybuilders tend to eat a much more diverse diet than their, than their omnivorous counterparts. And that's true of vegans in general. We just tend to eat more different kinds of food, which is healthy. Um, but because of that, I think a vegan um, bodybuilders eat a lot more different kinds of food. By and large, their, their macronutrient breakdown and their food choices mimic what mine are. Um, obviously, in a competition season, I'm going to be much more rigid on my choices than I am right now, where I'm just trying to maintain a healthy body weight and composition. But I do know a few vegan bodybuilders out there who go very much low carbohydrate when they diet, which is not typically done by other vegan athletes, even though it's done by the majority of the omnivorous community when it comes time to diet for a body competition. So there, there's some differentiation. I'd say most of them focus more on a higher carb, lower fat diet, which is very much in contrast with omnivores, but some decide to go the low carbohydrate route. Um, and I'm sorry, what was your second question? Uh, about protein. Oh, protein levels. Uh, there are benefits to eating above the recommended daily allowance of protein in terms of gaining muscle mass. In terms of longevity, I would say that probably the less protein, the better. There seems to be a good amount of research supporting that claim, at least until about the age of 65 or 70. And then more seems to be beneficial because it's your body isn't using it quite as efficiently. Um, but by and large, you know, the, the daily recommended allowance or daily recommended intake for men is about 55 grams per day. For women, it's about 45, um, which is pretty low, very easy to get eating whole foods. Uh, with muscle gain and muscle maintenance through dieting, uh, quite a bit more. You know, the um, research used to say that about one gram of protein per pound of body weight per day was kind of that maximizing intake level. Uh, but I've seen a, a number of studies more recently that actually take that quite a bit lower to about 0.6 or 0.7 grams per pound. So about between half and three quarters of your body weight in um, grams of protein per day. So for, you know, 150 pound individual, that would be, you know, 90 or hundred grams of protein per day, which is quite a bit more than the 45 to 55, but it doesn't mean we need to be 200, 300 grams a day to maximize our muscle protein synthesis. I kind of split the difference. I make sure we're getting at least that that daily recommended and a little bit more could be helpful because we do want to stay strong. We do want to maintain muscle mass. Um, but I also think that eating excessive protein, even if it's from whole plant sources, might be a bad thing in terms of longevity. And given that protein is in all plant-based foods, do you find that you just increase your calories and the amount of plants you're eating? So therefore you're increasing everything else along with protein, or do you just do you just focus on getting specific protein into your diet? It depends on good question. It depends on how many calories you're eating and, and what your goals are. So very much. So most of the year I eat a lot of food. I have a big appetite and I'm very active and I get plenty of protein for my food. Uh, I also like more higher protein foods like beans, tofu. Um, you know, I include soy milk in my diet, things like that, nuts and seeds. So I'm, I'm getting a good amount of protein just by eating a lot. When it comes time for a competition diet and I'm cutting calories, but I'm trying to keep my protein at the same level, regardless of how low I cut, then it becomes necessary for someone like me to shift into eating a lot of tofu, a lot of broccoli, a lot of beans, and not much else, which isn't very fun. Um, but for the general population, just trying to be healthy, I'd say absolutely follow your appetite. Make sure you get some higher protein foods in on a daily basis, be them beans, tofu, tempeh, nuts, and seeds. Um, and you should be absolutely fine and you should have a healthy and, 
you know, resilient body. And what's the key to staying motivated to lift five days a week or however many days that you recommend to, to lift? A lot of people have a hard time, you know, actually sticking to it and, and keeping that motivation up even after they maybe, you know, initially get started. Yeah, it's it, it can be a challenge, especially, you know, having I'm a parent of three now and I, I get it much more so than I did 10 years ago um, when it was a piece of cake and I wanted to train three times a day. Um, so I, I do understand that that can be a challenge. You're busy, you're tired. Uh, I would say accountability is very big. If you have a buddy or a group of friends that you meet in the gym that you strength train with, it's going to counteract some of those off days where you just aren't in the mood. You don't want to do it, but you don't want to let your friends down. So they're there for you when you don't feel the motivation, when you don't feel the, the desire to push and you just want to kind of veg out in front of the TV. And then subsequently, when you're feeling good, you're going to motivate them on their down days. So that is very much a beneficial give and take. Um, and research shows actually that people who are more social when they exercise, like racket sports, sports teams, um, or like buddy sessions at the gym, they have more benefit because social connections are so important for longevity and mental health as well as physical health. Um, so that's my number one tip is, is make it a social thing. Find accountability partners, you know, try and get your partner at home involved or your kids involved. If you want to do sports instead, um, that can be really, really beneficial. Great. Thank you. Our next question is going to be from CO. Please state where you're from and ask your question, although I'm having a hard time unmuting them. So uh, let's see, we're going to move to Halal has another question. So Halal, please state your question. Uh, yes. Uh, thank you. Um, I My question is about supplementing for vegan athletes with things like L-carnitine, taurine, and creatine. Um, it's very hard to get creatine from non-animal sources. I'm just wondering if you or other uh, vegan bodybuilders uh, are using supplements such as uh, L-carnitine, taurine, or creatine. Sure. Great question. Um, the research that I've seen on carnitine and taurine is very scant. I don't see a lot of benefit there, but I do know carnitine uh, feeds into the TMAO pathway in our gut microbiome. So if we have any kind of deleterious um, gut microbes, then the you know, amino acid carnitine can actually get them to produce TMAO, which is a molecule that is indicated in cardiovascular disease. So I definitely don't recommend supplementing with carnitine, even though it's supposed to have some fat loss benefits and body composition benefits. I've not really seen any convincing evidence of that. Um, taurine, likewise, I know it's in a lot of stimulants, energy drinks, pre-workouts, I've not seen anything convince me that it's necessary. Caffeine is shown to be very beneficial as long as you don't have anxiety or sleep problems. Caffeine early in the day can improve performance. Um, and then creatine, I definitely do supplement myself with creatine um, before a competition to get ready. Um, I know some vegan bodybuilders do. I know some who are totally whole foods, zero supplements. Uh, creatine is, you're right, it's, it's very hard to find outside of animal sources, but even omnivorous athletes and bodybuilders supplement with it because you get very little from animal products and none from plant products. Um, and it's produced in a lab, so it's not an ethical concern. Um, but it is, it is shown to be very safe. They have studies ranging 20, 30 years that show no deleterious effects. Um, I would say that the vast majority of people don't need to supplement, save your money, eat whole foods. It's always the best way to go. Um, but if you're an athlete and you're looking to, um, to supplement and to kind of bolster your performance, if you can, then the things I've seen that are safest and most convincing are, are caffeine, like from tea or coffee and then creatine as well. Hope that answers your question. So the, the uh, next question is going to be about, uh, about jogging and, uh, and its impact on, on your knees, your back, your bones is, is jogging safe for us? And, uh, and if, if it's not so safe on roads, is it better on grass or dirt? Great question. And I, I want to start with the caveat that I'm a little bit of a biased, um, uh, response here because I like weightlifting. I don't particularly enjoy jogging. Um, so, you know, if you talk to a running expert, they might feel very differently than I do. Uh, in my time as a personal trainer, I've trained hundreds or possibly thousands of, of clients. And I have found without exception that my most physically tight, stiff, least flexible, um, are runners, distance runners. So again, that's anic data. That's not, um, a case study by any means, but, I find that running tends to lead to a lot of oftentimes severe muscle tightness and yes, repetitive injury like knees and hips and lower back. Um, 
That being said, I think there are ways to run that are better. I think a lot of the problem is the shoes people wear. When you wear a typical running shoe that has a lot of support, a big thick cushioned heel, it leads to heel striking, which is certainly not optimal. It breaks down your knees. It breaks down your back. Um, and running on a perfectly flat rock hard surface also, I think is, is definitely not the way to go. I like, I'm a very big advocate of minimalist shoes. Um, a quarter of all the joints in your body are in your feet. And so if you are wearing these really supportive cushy shoes, you're not using any of that structure, any of that musculature that is really, really intricate and really precise. And it's designed to make your body move efficiently over the ground. Um, so I'm very much a fan of running over natural services, trail running, running on the grass, things like that in barefoot, barefoot or minimalist shoes or barefoot completely. If you're up for that, um, if you choose to run. And I think running can be very, very helpful, especially sprinting, like shorter duration, more intense running. Um, I like run, sprinting upstairs, sprinting up hills because it's actually easier on the joints. There's less impact when you're going on an incline and it's harder on the muscles and harder on the lungs and heart. Um, so I think there's a lot of benefits to running, but I would, I would, particularly be careful of running long distances on paved surfaces in traditional running shoes. And you mentioned running up an incline. How about running down the hill in order to get back to where you started? <laughs> Great question. Um, generally, it's fine. I wouldn't go all out speed downhill because uphill decreases your impact. Downhill increases it. Your foot falls farther. Um, I would say jogging at a, at a, a steady, comfortable pace downhill is not a concern unless you have specific, like I have knee problems, then don't do that. Um, but if you're running hill sprints, walking down the hill is a nice way to catch your breath and reset before the next sprint. So it really depends on your goals. If you're just going out for a run, sure, absolutely jog down the hill, run a little harder up the next hill. That's fine. If you're doing sprints that are trying to be all out intensity, I would say just walk down that hill, catch your breath, and that way you're ready to go and you're going to run even faster on your next sprint. Thank you. So um, you mentioned uh, runners being stiff. How important is stretching or can can you just do weightlifting without stretching? That's a great, great question. And I've actually done a 180 on this topic in the last few years. I got, um, I'm got i certified in muscle activation technique through um, uh, Institute of Denver, Colorado. And it has really opened my eyes on a lot of the, the neurology involved with muscle contraction and muscle um counterbalancing and centration of joints stretching especially long static stretching prior to exercise can destabilize your joints so i think stretching is can be very beneficial particularly if you do it away from some exercises but i'm very much in favor of dynamic mobility work before training so arm swings arm circles side lunges things that get your joints moving through a range of motion dynamically i think are a great way to warm up for exercise and a great way to make sure you have that range of motion and in terms of the research, um, strength training has actually been been shown to be just as beneficial for improving your flexibility as a designated static stretching program if you're using a full range of motion. So if you have one group of people and you take them and say, okay, you're going to do 20 minutes of static stretching five days a week, and you have the other group and say, okay, you're going to do you know strength training five days a week, at the end of the study, both people have improved their flexibility equally, but the people strength training got much stronger and built more muscle and all this other stuff too. Um, so while I don't think you have to stretch abs um, at all to be healthy and improve your flexibility, I like to do some dynamic work before strength training with all my clients and with myself, because I feel like it's going to help you have better form and warm up your tissues a little better. What about bone strength, avoiding osteoporosis? Does You, you mentioned, um, you know, weightlifting helping in that, that regard. What about things like walking, yoga? Does that help with, uh, with bone strength as well? Great question. And this is very much a concern you know, once you hit the age 65 and over, particularly with postmenopausal women. Um, bone density is, is absolutely essential for long term health. You need strong bones. So strength training is the best way to improve your bone density in terms of exercises. Um, anything with any sort of impact, though, uh, can be very good. I would say something like yoga with it or swimming that has no impact. Cycling also is not going to be very beneficial. Um, but it also is relative to where you're beginning. If you're starting from being sedentary, then any sort of loading you put on your structure at all is going to improve that bone density. Um, so if you don't walk, then starting to walk is going to be a great thing to do. If you don't, if you don't do yoga, starting yoga is going to be a great thing. Um, but the most efficient thing you can do for improving your bone density is strength training with an external load. Um, so I definitely recommend everyone do that um, because it does get very important as time passes. 
Okay, thank you. All right, our next question is coming from Steve. Steve, please state where you're from and ask your question. Hi, Steve from New York. Um, glad to hear you use um, tofu in your program. Apparently there's a lot of concern in the weightlifting community about phytoestrogens from flax and tofu. Um, what's your response to those things about that they, they lower testosterone and therefore affect the ability of putting on muscle? That's the question. Sure. Thanks, Steve. Um, this is one I've actually, I've asked you answer this question many times and I kind of chuckle to myself because my first response if an omnivore asked me that question is, do you know how much estrogen is in dairy products? Because they invariably say, I didn't think there was any. And it turns out it's orders of magnitude higher than the levels that are in plant foods like flax and soy. And it's also, it's not a phytosterol, it's bovine estrogen. And you can guess which one has a larger impact on humans. Um, so that's my first response is people eating dairy products are having way more estrogen and way stronger estrogen than anyone eating soy. Um, and the second, pro second um, question is looking at the research. People who eat soy have no impact on their testosterone levels. It's in the literature. So all they have to do is read it. Um, they also have lower risk of reproductive cancers. So that's breast and ovarian cervical cancer in women. And that's prostate cancer and testicular cancer in men. When you eat these phytosterols, it moderates your own hormones and lowers the risk of hormone mediated cancers. Um, also in men, it's prevents, it can prevent um, male pattern baldness, which is nice. <laughs> so um, I think these, these sterols are very much a good thing. They're also shown to moderate the levels or, or um, moderate some of the discomforts and the symptoms involved with menopause. They have a lot of health benefits uh, and, um, I think we should probably all be eating more phytosteroids or sterols than, um, than we currently do. I don't worry about it at all. I eat tofu and soy on a regular basis. Um, and I encourage everyone else to as well, unless they have an allergy. Okay. What nutritional supplements do you recommend for everyday people that want to be strong and healthy? Great question. Um, there's two categories of, of supplements that, that we could talk about. One is performance and one is just everyday wellness. So it sounds like nutritional is the everyday wellness category. You really don't need much uh, aside from as, as a plant-based eater, aside from B12 and maybe vitamin D. Um, the vast majority of people don't get outside enough. And so vitamin D becomes essential when you're not getting that sunlight. And then B12 is just, you know, our food is, is triple washed and packaged. And if you eat animal products, it's treated with 15,000 pounds of antibiotics. So people aren't consuming bacteria like we did when we were natural wild creatures. Um, and so supplementing with B12 makes sense, whether you're a vegan or an omnivore. Um, I will say in the winter months when we're getting less produce, um, less fresh produce, I should say, and um, it's flu and cold season, I, I do supplement my family with a multivitamin. I try to get the most naturally sourced one, um, but that's for about three months of the year. And the rest of the time we eat lots and lots of fresh produce. We get lots of sunshine and I don't worry about it. Um, so um Wellness supplements, that's really my only recommendation is maybe the B12 and the vitamin D. Other than that, eat lots of fruits and vegetables and you should be fine. We're going to do two more questions, if that's all right, Michael. That, that's great. Jay, please state where you're from and, and ask your question. Hi, Jay. I'm from the um, UK, Birmingham in the UK. Yeah. Um, what I want to know is I'm in my late 50s. I am st started uh, resistance training and uh, I've read that uh, beans and lentils are a good source of protein, but on the other hand, there's a lot of carbs in um, these items, and I'm trying to lose weight as well. So, what would be what would you be recommending for protein along those lines? Sure. Hey, Jay. Great question. Um, yes, the thing about whole plant foods in particular is they're a complete food. So, in whole plants, you're going to have protein, you're going to have carbs, and you're going to have fats, and you're going to have fiber and nutrients as well. It's not so much like animal products where there's here's something that's just fat, here's something that's just protein, and it's much more compartmentalized. So it is not a bad thing at all that those legumes have carbs. Carbs are actually beneficial for keeping you satisfied and for fueling your exercise and recovery. Um, if your goal is weight loss, just eating a healthy diet and getting exercise, if those are not things you've been doing, that should be enough to elicit a change. So it's all, everything you do is relative to what your body is used to doing. Um, if you're not used to eating a lot of high fiber whole plant foods and you're not used to strength training, you should see a lot of benefit from making those two changes. If you're not, then um, maybe considering your calorie intake um, because carbs in and of themselves don't cause weight gain. It's overeating. It's over consuming calories. Um, and yes, eating a low carb diet works because people who eat low carb diets are cutting their calories. 
The same thing can be said of a low fat diet. You cut out fat. A lot of times people are dropping their caloric intake. Um, so if you're eating lots of whole plant foods, the good news is there's lots of fiber, there's lots of bulk, you get full faster. So you will probably naturally be reducing your calories. So that combined with exercise, I think you'll do fine. Um, if you wanna up your protein a little bit, focus on the more protein dense foods like tofu and tempeh. Um, and, and that may help a little bit as well. Okay, and last question, um, calcium supplements. Uh, what are your thoughts about uh, with calcium su supplements with regard to heart health? Sure. Um, this is not uh, something I know a ton about, so I'm going to have that little caveat in there. With calcium supplements, I do know that uh, absorption is a big concern. To, to properly absorb calcium, you need to have adequate levels of vitamin D and I believe vitamin K. Um, and you also want to make sure that you're not eating things that are inhibiting mineral absorption. Um, and specifically to that, that's oftentimes tea and coffee can inhibit, inhibit mineral absorption. Um, I'm not sure if this is talking about like calcification of blood vessels um, or things like that, or calcium mediated muscle contraction. Um, so I'm not positive, but in any case, uh, things that improve calcium absorption from your food or a supplement are like natural acids, vitamin C, like citrus, citric acid from citrus, um, vinegar. Um, those things are going to improve absorption. Coffees and teas can, can actually inhibit it. So you don't want to eat these foods or supplements around there. Um, and just make sure you're getting a, a diet that's rich in especially leafy green vegetables and whole grains. Those are typically the best source of minerals, including calcium. Um, you shouldn't need to supplement unless your doctor says so. But if there's a specific problem and you have concerns, um, I would see a doctor or, or a um, registered dietitian to determine what the best course of action is there. Thank you. And if I may, just one quick thing on tea. Is it just the tea from like the tea tree or is it like herbal teas as well when you say tea? It, it is tea from the tea tree. That specific plant can inhibit mineral absorption. And, and that's any mineral, iron, magnesium, calcium. Um, so if you are worried about your mineral levels, you probably want to space out. Tea is a very, very healthy beverage, but maybe don't have it with your meals so that you can get the most of, of both benefits. Thank you so much, Derek. Please uh, unmute the audience. And we greatly appreciate um, every you, this whole cranberry. Thank you so much. That was awesome. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Cranberry nuts. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's healthy, right? Yeah. Thank you, everyone, for coming. It was a pleasure, and I hope you all learned something useful.